G'day there guys, it's your Aussie hubby Marky, back at it again with another r slash revenge video. Now with that said, I want you to sit back, relax, chug a prawn on the barbie, and get ready for some bloody good revenge stories. Now our first post today is by user PJXPAT, titled, The Story on How I Got Promoted to Director of Sales and Sales Recruitment. Now, I've been with my current employer for many, many years now. Even though I've quit, I've come back to them. My company also had an incentive if an employee comes up with a way to do business better or changes something that has a net benefit to the company, they get a percentage of the increased revenue slash profit. Over the years with this company, I have had several major impacts. Well, about a year ago, I was talking to a senior levels manager, let's call him Bob, and Bob was telling me about how the company has been having an issue in recruitment and hiring of new talent for our sales division. Now. I had been in sales before and knew of the pitfalls our structure created and why senior reps would excel and junior reps would get crushed, and had a really good idea on our turnover challenges. Then, one night I had an idea on how to change the sales structure of our company, almost entirely, which would still retain our senior reps, but also make it easier for younger, more junior reps to find success and stability by a result of reducing turnover. I spent a good amount of time designing this plan before I ever presented it to anyone, since this was Bob's area of expertise. After many revisions and bouncing it around my head, I called Bob and I presented my idea to Bob. Bob liked it a lot, however, he had a few minor tweaks, and he brought up concerns company executives would have. I tweaked the plan and came up with rebuttals to those objections, and shared my plan with Bob. I did this several times, I would say though my plan stayed about 90% original. Bob had been with our company for decades at this point, and I've known him for the entire time, so I trusted Bob would be sure to credit me. Considering my name was all over my presentation I sent to Bob, I expect Bob to share in the love with me should there be any. I felt like I needed Bob as an ally to make my idea work, which is why I brought him in my plan. I followed up with Bob and he basically made it seem like my idea was rejected, that the company was going to keep on doing what it's always done. Okay, fine, whatever, crap happens, it's not the first time my idea has been rejected. And cue a few months later, and our new fiscal year is starting and our CEO calls everyone to a company wide meeting. And as I sit down to watch, I witness our CEO praise Bob for coming up with a brilliant new sales structure, strategy and compensation plan. It is my plan with my name removed. The CEO is gushing over how wonderful this idea is and how he thinks it will benefit us greatly. I'm fudging fuming. Ticked Bob stole my work, put his name on it and took credit. He violated my trust and lied to me. He told me the company had rejected the idea, yet here I am watching the company implement my idea. I get on the phone with my VP and let loose. Now. My VP, let's call him Tim, is a really good guy and I trust him. Tim is taken aback and says that right around the time I presented my plan to Bob, Bob started presenting to senior management and it was almost immediately considered a great idea. In fact, Bob knew the company was considering forcing him into retirement because they felt Bob was holding the company back and the company needed to make a change, and this idea saved Bob's job. Now to give you an overview of how in-depth my plan was. It completely restructured compensation plan, completely changed how we present ourselves to new potential hires, completely changed our sales training to be more focused on real-world realities, refined the sales order process to reduce workload and streamline, did all that using current infrastructure, each step included suggestions on how to implement the change, and Bob oversaw all of this in his current role. I then asked if I could prove that it was my idea, that I had presented it to Bob and so forth. Now, Bob and I had discussed this over email and Facebook Messenger, and another chat app. I went through our emails, Facebook Messenger, and the chat app, and took screenshots, created a PowerPoint which makes it easier to present ideas, and sent it to my VP. Two days later, my VP called and said I needed to go into a conference call with HR, my VP, and the CEO. In that meeting, we discussed the plan I had created, the collaboration I had done with Bob, and my plan to implement it. Not only that I presented the research I had done, which Bob did not have access to, 
and justified why my idea was a good idea. The CEO seemed impressed with what I had done and convinced that I was the true creator. I was then asked what I thought had happened and I straight up accused Bob was stealing my idea and removing my name from it in an attempt to further his career. I was told they would be having a separate meeting with Bob and after that they would inform me of any future changes. A week later, my VP called me and asked me if I was offered the chance to implement my plan, would I be willing to do that? This was obviously a promotion and I said of course. Two weeks later, I get a call from my VP telling me he's coming to my location to visit me. He also tells me I should make sure I look sharp and presentable, and I tried to figure out why he was coming, but he wouldn't say. Two days later, I come into the office, check my email. Now, all big retirements slash resignations are announced company-wide. I see an email stating that Bob has retired. What I found strange is the retirement date was effective immediately, and that his replacement will be announced shortly. Generally, there is a time period for a takeover to happen, and the replacement is announced in the email, along with a brief overview of their qualifications. The time for my VP to show comes, and in walks my VP and the CEO. We go out to lunch, and the CEO says, PJ, I came to visit you because I always think it's best to give people major promotions than news in person but I'd like to offer you the position of Director of Sales and Sales Recruitment and put you in charge of implementing your idea. To which I accepted, naturally. Then I asked, is this why Bob, um, retired? To which the CEO smiled and said, after talking to you and talking to Bob and discussing it among senior management, it was decided that it was time for a change. Time to inject new blood into our organization and Bob really wanted to start his retirement so it was best for everyone. I smiled and said thank you. I know perfectly well Bob intended on working until the day he died. Our next post is by user Poor Man's Yacht Club, titled The Old Uno Reverse Card. One day I came from work and someone else's car was parked out the front of my house. No matter, I parked outside my neighbor's house. When I wake up the next day and go to my car to leave for work, there's a note tucked into my windshield. I unfold it and it reads, do not park here ever again or else, in a font so large it takes up the whole page of paper. I folded it up, placed it in my glove box and there it sat for nearly a year, until the day he parked out front of my house. I tucked the note he left on his window and went to bed. The next day as I was enjoying my coffee, I watched his wife go to get in the car and noticed the note. She read it with a puzzled look and quickly turned to rage. I thought she would storm over to ask me about it, but apparently she recognized her husband's handwriting and went to ask him. He had to sheepishly explain to her that he had left it on my car and she brought him over, tail between his legs to apologize. We had a beer and he stared at the floor the whole time. It was cool. Our next post is by user Revolutionary Basil, titled Try to elbow your way to the front at a gig? I'll guess I'll just sing to every song. This was a few years ago in Spain. I just happened to find out that one of my favorite bands were playing a gig on the other side of the country from where I was living. As the gig was on my birthday weekend, I figured, why not? So I found someone else who wanted to go. We organized it and all planned for a fun weekend of sightseeing and music. Fast forward to the gig itself. We got there at a good time so we could grab a drink and find a good spot to watch the stage. Just as the band came on, two Spanish girls started elbowing their way towards the stage, deciding to stop just in front of me, which was pretty infuriating, as they were also holding their phones up to video the band, blocking my view. Now, I know every song of this band and I have a singing voice like a cat being washed, so I hit upon a perfect revenge. Every time this girl tried to film, I would sing along at the top of my voice. Every. Damn. Song. As well as singing along in her ears, just for fun. I ended up having a great time when avoiding her elbows, and she has zero video without my voice in it. Our next post is by Dewana, titled, The School Counselor Called Me A Liar. This happened about 10 years ago when I was in the 11th grade. I had to make up a 0.5 over credit for a math class I screwed around in in my freshman year. 
So for the first half of the school year, I made up my credit and was finished with my math class for the rest of the time in high school. At the end of the semester, the school passes out our new schedule for the second semester. Well, they gave me mine and it was missing one of my classes. They didn't bother placing me in another class at all and just left it blank. I had no way of getting home one hour early, so I needed another class to fill my schedule. Well, here's where it gets interesting. Well, I went to the guidance counselor to fix this mistake. Well, the only way to see a counselor is to check in at the main desk and wait. Well, my math class was my last period, so I sat in the office until school was let out and went home. Next day, instead of my last period class, I sat in the office until the bell rang. I did this four days and went back to my math class and sat there. The math teacher got irrationally angry and kicked me out of class because I didn't belong there. Well, day five of sitting in the office, I decided to tell my mother and my mother's way of dealing with things like this was calling her mother. Personally, I hate my grandmother because she's a mean and hateful person, but it worked out for me this time. She called the school to talk about the three different people until she got on the line with my counselor. Well, she called my grandmother a liar and said I've been skipping classes every day. She later called me to the office and showed me her sign-in sheet. She said, how dare you lie to your grandmother? You never signed my sheet. Well, she showed me a yellow piece of paper and the one I signed was a purple construction paper like sheet. Well, I told her what I thought about her and she sent me back to class. My grandmother did not take being called a liar nicely. She knows the head of the school council and called him. From what I heard, she led into him so badly that she called my counselor and just led into her. She called me back to her office a little later and apologized to me and said she would immediately fix my schedule. A whole week after the schedules went out, the head council member said he was tired of her crap and wanted to fire her, but she begged him on the phone. She kept her job for two more years after this, and because I didn't need an actual class, they made me an office aide and received 100% A in that class and watched soap operas with the nurse every day and hung out with another good friend who was an aide too. Sorry for my bad writing, I went to school in rural Florida. That's swamp country, isn't it? We're swamp people out here. Our next post is by user Future Butterscotch 9 titled Cheating Boyfriend Betrayed by His Good Christian Sister in the Best Possible Way. This story is now somewhat famous in my circle of friends, and one finally roped me into spilling it on here. Here you go, Evan. This is the tale of myself and this perfect girl named Charlie. Part 1 Exposition this took place roughly two years ago at the twilight of my senior year high school. It was early May, and our graduation was set for early June. So with most of our brains switched to summer mode and our teachers fresh out of screws to give, my friends and I finally fell in line with the majority of our class and started ditching. Our friend group consisted of a handful of minor characters, in addition to my boyfriend of three years. Kyle, my best friend since middle school, Sarah, myself, and a recent inclusion, Brad, who, not gonna lie, was and is a bit of a white knight. White knight, white knight. Kyle belonged to a Christian family. No, not the nice, charity-giving, actually Christian Christians, but rather the homophobic, slur-singing, will kick a homeless guy in the face and then sit in church, act like a saint Christians. They always went to church every Wednesday and Friday, and while they invited me, I never went, due to being A, an agnostic, B, a closeted bisexual, and C, almost physically sick from their hypocrisy. They never really liked me because of this. They also were entitled. It wasn't evident until they got into trouble. You see, they helped organize the church's funding, grants, donations, charity, maintenance, etc., which put them pretty high on the pecking order. The church, while not the centerpiece of our part of town, still claimed a lot of the district's authority figures as patrons. It was the sort of unofficial institution that sneaks its way into politics without ever being directly involved. So whenever they got pulled over or issued a parking ticket, they would drop a couple names and dodge the whole thing. Kyle himself was decent. I'd known him since elementary school. He was usually nice and he was hot. Shallow, I know, but it was high school. 
So I tolerated his idiotic and oftentimes narcissistic behavior. They treated him like God's gift to Earth. But it was his sister, Charlie, who redeemed the whole family. She was a year younger than I and Kyle, and was the only genuine Christian in the group. However, she also had an impish streak in her that led to some fun hijinks. You could always tell she had a devilish epiphany with this little half smile that she'd make. We'd often hang out and she was a blast to be around. We were very close and she often confided in me about stuff she couldn't tell her family. To me, a great friend, to them, the perfect little Christian daughter. Sarah was a really good friend who had helped me through the death of my mum. I wasn't diagnosed with depression or anything major, but I loved my mum to pieces and it shattered me. Her and Carl were always there for me and she was the one who pushed me to ask him out. I trusted her about as much as any teen as I could. Anyways, back to the story. One fateful Tuesday, Kyle, Sarah, myself, and our mutual friends headed downtown to get food, skate, and generally do stereotypical annoying teenage stuff. Getting bored of our current activities, I asked Kyle if he wanted to race on our boards to the end of the street. It was just past the lunch rush, so most people were either back in their offices or stuck in traffic. He accepted, and about 30 seconds and a loose flagstone later, I ended up planting my face into the sidewalk and fracturing my arm. I tried to shake it off, but no one else was having it, considering I was walking like a newborn deer and my arm was beginning to swell. We ended up making a visit to the ER, where they confirmed that yes, I did have a fractured arm and a concussion to boot. The concussion was my idiot tax. It wasn't too big of a deal as far as accidents go, but considering my sorry state, they wanted me to stick around so they could do a few more tests, brace my arm, and generally just ensure that I was healthy enough to return to my idiotry. Thankfully, Kyle and Sarah had offered to stay with me, because apparently their parents didn't care and we were already ditching, so school the following day wasn't a big issue. I ended up spending the night in the hospital. The hospital had been understaffed for years, so once your condition was deemed stable enough, they tended to shove you into limbo, and went home the following day with the usual concussion orders. Effectively, I was to become a vegetable for 10 days. Wanting to get back to my recently attained freedom I complied, meaning I spent about 7 days sleeping and eating. I only picked up my phone after the doctor cleared me, to which I found an unexpected message. Part 2. The Act Brad had gotten my number from Kyle, and sent me a link to a private data storing account. One of those services where you can upload pictures, videos, etc, and lock it behind a passcode for personal use only. And a password. I, being intrigued by this sudden plot hook in my boring life, followed it to find literal gigabytes of pictures, all showing Kyle and Sarah in compromising positions and captions hollering things that were definitely not beneficial to their relationship with the Lord. I'm talking everything from individual nudes taken from the chat of snaps, to full-on money shots and everything in between. It looked like an amateur porn album. The most recent of which was dated to, as you probably guessed, that Tuesday evening. Brad explained that Kyle had this whole thing where he'd upload videos of him and Sarah, doing it for his close circle to whack off at. I personally would have simply used Pornhub like a normal human, but Kyle had always been a little self-infatuated, so I wasn't too surprised at this narcissist level move. Narcissus, sorry. Brad had apparently just been included and was sickened by the whole thing. For some context, in our three years of dating, the furthest Kyle and I had gone was a BJ after a football game that January. He spewed BS about saving it for marriage while dicking down my BFF. I was shattered. The two people I had placed my unconditional trust in had, without my knowing, been taking turns pounding that trust away, all the while being fully aware that of their importance in my life. I confronted Kyle about this when we next hung out at his place, and he denied everything at first, said I was being a paranoid tramp. When I showed him the evidence, he involved his parents, who started claiming I photoshopped the photos and videos, and threatened that they would report me for making child porn. Sarah and Kyle had only just turned 18 the past September. Knowing the police would prove me right, but not wanting to tank Brad for possession, our city had been throwing the book at people for this for years, I dropped it and I left. I thought we'd broken up, 
but apparently his parents insisted we stay together until after graduation to save face with his extended family. Apparently they knew deep down he was guilty, but the usual entitled parent tendencies flared up. Not wanting to make waves, yet, I reluctantly complied and began regressing into my earlier negative mental spaces. Part 3. The Revenge the funny thing about religious families is that they are just as prone to producing LGBT children as non-religious ones. Kyle had avoided the sickness, Charlie hadn't. Not one week after our argument, I was at Kyle's house, helping him keep up the act. We hardly interacted, so I turned to Charlie for companionship. This typically happened when Kyle and I would get into fights, as Charlie's chill demeanor and deep concern often led me to confide in her sometimes with things I didn't even share with Sarah. This being the biggest argument of our relationship was no different. While we were chilling in her room, she started to get really antsy. Her normal bubbly demeanor was gone. Contrary to your typical homosexual, I didn't have a strong gaydar, so I assumed she'd learned of Carl's infidelity. Well, yes, but actually no. I asked her what was wrong, and she said she had a secret to spill. I wasn't really in the mood for drama or comforting, but it being Charlie, I let her go. In what has yet to be the second biggest surprise of my life, she told me about how she'd been in the closet for years, 14 or 15 when she first started figuring it out, and apparently for a long time she'd been trying to get closer to me because I was the only person she truly felt comfortable around. Her family was almost stereotypically homophobic and really only approved of her church friends. She was jealous of Kyle and our relationship, but thinking I was straight and not wanting to rock the boat, she resigned herself to her angsty teenage heartache. That was until the HMS relationship struck an infidelity iceberg, and she figured she could finally shoot her shot. Now, given any other circumstance, I would have said hell no. We'd known each other for over a decade, and I'd been dating her brother for three years. It would have been scummy, and Charlie was practically a sister to me at this point, but the blood started rushing and the lizard brain started screaming for payback. I'll spare the details for her privacy, but one woohoo later, and her and I were enjoying the afterglow when the gears really started turning. I felt like crap. I knew what I'd done was wrong, but given my current situation, I frankly didn't care about that. I more so felt bad for Charlie. At the time, my feelings were twisted and painful, and I thought I didn't really like her that way. So I thought I'd just one and done the only non-family member who I still trusted. She caught on to the vibe I was giving off, and ended up talking me out of some bad thoughts while we got dressed and said our goodbyes. We ended up continuing the relationship after that. For her, she finally got to be with her longtime crush, and I got an escape. When the day of graduation came and went, we maintained the charade until both our families, as well as their church group, went over to their place for a massive dinner celebration and commemorative slideshow. Now, I'd known about this event since the fall, and hadn't thought too much into it until the incident. During our fling, Charlie had been pushing me out of my slump and towards thoughts of vengeance. Apparently, her parents had been spreading rumors to their church group that I had been cheating on Kyle and they were saying that after the dinner, he was going to dump me, in front of an entire crowd that included my family. I didn't really care about myself, but my dad had gotten a lot of flack for remarrying after my mum died. Some of it even came from me, but having the perspective of age and distance, I got over it. I was not about to have him publicly embarrassed by some crapheads who thought they blessed the ground they walked on. Before, it was just petty high school drama. But this was no joke. My dad worked for the district rep's office. The district rep grew up at that church. It was part of his one of the people persona. A few choice words and my dad's job would be history. Guess Kyle's parents in their malignancy never thought that part through. Or maybe they did and I'm giving them too much credit. Either way, this was now personal. So, Charlie being her impish self, began scheming. She was loved by the church group, so it was easy for her to get the role of prepping the slideshow. She even gave a whole speech about how she couldn't wait to finally give her brother and his friends the recognition they deserved. She then began compiling the videos and photos from the Circle Jerk account that Kyle had made. 
ADH hadn't changed the password. Alongside screenshots of their conversation in a group chat they had. She got those by borrowing his phone, making a call, and sending the screenshots to her phone before deleting them from the message history, and integrated them into a slideshow. It was structured so that a slide would pop up with a bunch of pictures of the boys in question alongside their favorite Bible quotes. Then the next slide would include the screenshots of their respective conversations and whatever pictures they had listed as their favorites, censored and from after they had turned 18 for obvious reasons. Altogether, this slideshow took Charlie a few days to compile, but not once did she complain or ask for a break. She was on a mission, and alongside being hot in its weird way, it was also shifting my perspective on our relationship. So the night comes, and we're all sitting around the table, making small talk and putting on our best fake smiles. Several church families are giving me smug, you're gonna get what's coming to you, looks. But I shrugged them off and stuck with my family for most of the night. Charlie and I avoided each other to ensure no one got suspicious. Finally, the moment of truth came. Everyone was called into the backyard where they had rows of chairs set up in front of a massive projector. Charlie portrayed her best innocent little sister act before starting the soundtrack. The slides began to roll and people began to gasp and yell in tune to Good Old Days by Macklemore. Seeing the looks on Kyle and his family's faces as they realized what was happening was priceless. In turn, each boy was brought on screen and put on blast, and each time everyone was too busy recovering from the whiplash to stop it. The few that did tried to grab Charlie's laptop, but she quickly scooped it up and ran into the house, locking herself in a bathroom. The projector was wireless. No one thought to turn off the projector. Idiots. Finally, after almost five minutes of Bible quotes and nudes, the boy of the hour was put on screen. His quote, Hebrews 13.4, Give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. It was intended to create the setup for my humiliation. Oh, how the turntables. A handful of videos played showing his 18 plus exploits, alongside screenshots of the rows of content he had made with texts dating back to the summer of 2017 implying the length of his fling. It hurt to watch, but I found my solace in the sweet nectar of vengeance laid before my eyes. Finally came the last slide, a blank white page with a single audio file link. Even I was confused at this point, seeing as audio wasn't included in our plans. Charlie crept back outside and clicked play, and Kyle's parents' voices came screaming through the speakers. Apparently, Charlie had recorded their entire humiliation plan in detail and had added it to the slideshow as evidence of my impending setup. The girl had covered all bases, and when the show ended, she stood next to the projector, beaming that devilish half-grin. It took a few seconds for anything to happen. Kyle and his family beat a hasty retreat to the house, but the party being at their place, they had nowhere to go. Several church members conveyed their disgust at Charlie, Kyle, and the boys in equal measure for the event. She ignored them, called out to her parents, and waited for them to peep their heads out. When they did, she quickly planted a massive kiss on my cheek and pronounced herself as gay. Needless to say, that didn't go down well. My parents and I left in a hurry, and Charlie, now deep in crap, came with us. Part 4. The Aftermath Charlie and I had been dating since. As you probably guessed, her family have cut ties with her, so she ended up crashing at my place. My stepmom wasn't too pleased with how she'd gone about my revenge, but my dad thought it was hilarious. He collected his $20 from my stepmom. They'd had a bet over when I'd come out, apparently, and argued on our behalf for Charlie to stay over. After all, they had an interesting first impression, and there was no risk of pregnancy. To top it off, it was the perfect way for them to spite Kyle's family after they'd trashed my reputation and tried to make me an outcast. He caught some jokes and snide remarks at work for the next few weeks, but given the circumstances and the fact that I was a teenage daughter, apparently we're prone to bouts of roguishness? He got off, no harm. As for Kyle, you say? Well, 
His family got barred from their church after his collection came to light, which caused them to fall from local grace. They lost the ear of local officials and the various name drops they'd been using to avoid various fines and penalties caught up to them. Last I heard from Sarah, they had moved to the next state over and Kyle was living sexless in his parents' basement, squeaking by at a community college. Sarah and I made up eventually. It took a lot of apologizing and no small amount of groveling on her part. But not wanting to resent her for the rest of my life, I got over myself and allowed her back in. We're not as close as we used to be, but that trust is slowly growing back. Let's just hope that she keeps her stuff in her pants this time. Charlie and I lived together until I went off to college, where we've been long distance since. She managed to get into a school two hours away, so we often spend weekends at each other's dorms or somewhere in between, doing our typical hedonistic thing. It's taken me some time to fully recover, and as cathartic as our revenge felt, it did little to truly bring me solace. Despite the implications of this story, I had a real deep connection with Kyle, and while it's easy to write off as teenage drama, it still scarred me. My family and Charlie have helped me rebuild. Our relationship may have begun unconventionally and could certainly be classifiable as trashy, but we don't care. We're happy, and I have a girl who's gone above and beyond for me. Not everyone can say that. And I think that's where I'm going to leave today's episode, guys. I hope you enjoyed this episode of r slash revenge. Tell me what you thought of it down in the comments. I hope you notice a uh, significant increase in audio quality. I did get a new microphone, so I hope you guys enjoy it. Tell me if there's any issues with audio, whatever. I'd love to hear your opinions, whatever you're up to today as well. Tell me down in the comments. This has been Marky, and I'll see you in the next episode. Bye.